Hello, my name is Mike Logston. I'm the pastor of the First Baptist Church here in Easton, Maryland. I'm delighted that you have chosen to join us today. We know that real life is not lived on the Sundays, but what we like to say between the Sundays or in our normal, everyday lives. Our prayer is that what you hear today will help you connect intimately with God and will equip you to live out your faith this next upcoming week. We hope that the next few minutes will inspire you to become more like Jesus, God's one and only Son, the Savior of the world. Again, thanks for watching and listen carefully as you hear God speak to you from His Word today. Christ died for us and now everything indeed has changed and with it, with this incredible change, now we are stuck in a position where sometimes the things that we see may not exactly be what they seem like. With this change that Calvary and the empty tomb brought, it opened up the door that now not everything that we see can we always accept and take at face value. There's something different and changed because of what Christ did. In fact, it's kind of like the guy who is walking down the road and he came across this, this weird scene. He saw this, these two caskets on horse-drawn carriages. And behind the caskets, there was a man with a dog on a leash. And behind the man and the dog on the leash, there was a long line of single-file people just following along, long line of guys, men, following along behind on this funeral procession. This guy thought, this is really strange. What, what in the world is this? So finally he mustered up the nerve and, and he caught up with the guy and he went up and he said to the guy walking the dog, he said, what in the world is going on? What, what is all of this? And the man carrying or walking the dog said, well... These two caskets, this one right here is my, my wife. And this one right over here, this is my mother-in-law. The guy said, well, what, what's this dog? Well, this dog is the one who killed both of them. This guy thought, man, this, this is just strange. This is... But then he thought, well, I'd like to have a dog like that. And he said to the man walking the dog, he said, can I have that dog? I don't know what you're going to do with it. Could, could I have him? Could I pay you for him? And the man walking the dog just looked at him and said, look, if you want to buy this dog, you're going to have to get in line behind all the others. <laughs> uh, not everything is exactly what it seems. Easter is one of those interesting days when, let's face it, many people come to church who would maybe not otherwise come to church. A lot of people stay away because they think that when they come, they see all of these people and they think, gosh, I know them and they look like they've got it all together and, and it just doesn't seem to, to square with what I know about them. Or they think, gosh, look at them. They've got these great marriages. They've got these great families. Just look at them. I mean, gosh, either I don't belong at this place or these people, I just, this cannot be real. Something just does not seem right. And then Easter makes it even worse because then you come and you meet all of these people who are at their best and they've dressed up to their best. And I mean, even on Easter, guys, you know, they don't even hesitate or flinch to wear pastels, right? And you're thinking, this just cannot be right. By the way, this is not pink. Okay, Reggie? It's, yeah, no, well, it's kind of a raspberry-ish or something like that. It's not pink. All right? But, but guys, you know, they, they wear these, these pastel colors. They don't even flinch. And you come in and they just look like they have it all together. And you think, gosh, look at them. They seem to have answers. They seem to not have doubts. They just seem to have it all together and just everything right in place. And I just don't feel like I belong in a place like that because I know I've got questions. I've got doubts. I've got thoughts about my life and where I've been and what's God going to do with that and what is he going to do with me. I just don't know if I can belong. In fact, I've heard people say, you don't want me to come to that church, Pastor. Because if I came to that church, the minute I walked into that building, the walls would surely come tumbling down. People just stay away for all, for all kinds of different reasons. But I want to dispel a myth for you this morning. The church is not a place of perfect people. In fact, I'll be the first one to tell you, I am not perfect. I'm not perfect as a dad. I'm not perfect as a husband. In many different arenas, I am not perfect. I'll be the first one to tell you, I do not have perfect kids. 
We went on a trip just the other day. We went over to Northern Virginia. Driving down the road in our van, if you could be a fly in the van, you would learn a whole lot of, of how not to parent by watching me. In fact, I have shared before, one of my sons, if he was not so cute, he probably would already be dead by now. <laughs> I just do not have perfect parents. In fact, I mean, perfect kids, they have flawed parents. I don't even have a perfect why, well, my wife is up here. I'm going to let you ask her about that later. I'm not even going to touch that one. This is not a place for perfect people. And everything is not always exactly what it looks like on the outside. And if you've come this morning with a past that you're not sure of or a present that you're not really sure what God is going to do with it, well, you've come to the right place. Because the empty tomb is God's megaphone announcing that everything has changed. And it's God telling us that no matter what your life failures are, your spiritual struggles or indiscretions, then you need not look any further than one of the most flawed guys to see how God is going to deal and treat our failures. In fact, if you would, I want to invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 14. We're going to look at a guy who went from the pit of spiritual failure to the peak of spiritual leadership. In a matter of a couple of months, this guy will go from the biggest betrayer, disloyal follower of Jesus to one of the most prominent outspoken speakers and leaders of God's church. We're going to look at the, the life of Peter, and we're going to see that his change from failure to leader should tell us that the gospel is good news about real life change that's made possible through Jesus and Jesus alone. And we're going to see three things. We're just going to walk through, and we're going to see three things this morning. The first one is this. The gospel tells us that everything has changed because the gospel erodes our self-admiring sense of religion. If you have come this morning thinking that God looks at you and is pleased because of something that you have done, the gospel makes it very clear that that is not the way that God looks on us and sees us with approval. In fact, if anybody is the epitome of self-focused religion, Peter is the man. Do you know that this gospel that you're looking at, if you have it open in Mark, do you realize that this gospel, according to the early church, some in the early church said that this was the memoirs of Peter's life. And what we're going to see is one of the most poignant pictures of failure in spiritual life that we will ever see. But what we're going to see here is that the gospel erodes our self admiring sense of religion. In fact, Jesus says to him, look, all of you are going to be scattered. You're all going to fall away. In verse 29, Peter says, Jesus, I will never deny you. Even if everybody else does, Jesus, it will not be me. In fact, what we're going to see is while Jesus is on trial, Peter at the same time in kind of a parallel sense is going to be on trial as well. And what Peter is really saying is, look, Jesus, I know all of these other kooks and these characters that have been following with us, but I'm telling you, I'm the man, and I deserve your attention, I deserve your love, I deserve your admiration. In fact, all of these guys were in it because not much earlier in the life of Jesus, these guys were following along, and they were just questioning among themselves, hey, who's greater, me or you? you know, no, 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 I don't think you've got it, I think I've got it, I think I'm the greatest. And they went back and forth, and later Jesus got them together and wouldn't, could you imagine having a friend who knows everything, even your thoughts? And he looks at you and says, hey, what, what were you guys talking about back there? And you have no hout. You know, if you don't say exactly what you were talking about, he's going to know. We were arguing about who is the greatest. And then he gives this incredible lesson about who is the greatest. In fact, Peter, I mean, if anybody, Peter... It, Surely he would be the guy who would not fall. Do you remember Jesus came walking on the water and he had learned his lesson. He was in the boat with all the others and he said, Hey Jesus, just tell me to get out of the boat and I'll walk on the water with you in spite of the storm and all this stuff going around. And so what does Jesus do? He calls his bluff. Come on, Peter. Let's go. <laughs> what do you do now? Well, you either go or you don't. So Peter jumps out and he starts walking on water. He takes his eyes off Jesus and he begins to sink. Surely Peter had learned his lesson by now, hadn't he? But no, here at the last he's saying, God, Jesus, if everybody else falls away, I will not. I'm the man. How do we know Peter is caught in this serious destructive game of 
spiritual competition and comparison. Look down at verse 31. But Peter insisted emphatically. Jesus said, look, Peter, before this night is up three times, air just going to flow off of your tongue and you are going to deny me three times. But look at verse 31. Peter insisted emphatically. And I think the words I ought to be emphasized. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. See, that's what religion is all about. It's not about God. Religion is about I. And the gospel erodes our ability to stand before God and say, I, I, and me, and what I have done. The minute we get in this spiritual comparison, all of a sudden we begin to keep score. You remember, some of you have kids. You remember when they were little, Christy? You remember? Not too long ago, right, guys? <laughs> and they would look at, one, at, at you and say, he got more than I did, right? His, her glass is a little bit higher than mine. You ever do that and you, you put them up next to each other and you see who's got more drink in the glass, right? In fact, just yesterday, my kids were opening up their Easter baskets and they were looking at all their stuff and one, one of them came and got his and then the other one came and one of my sons said, wait a second, and he started counting. He said, you've got nine things in your basket? Hold on, I'll be right back. And he went running into his room just to make sure that he had the exact same number of things in his Easter basket as his other brother had in his basket. Oh, we just love to keep score. But you know what? In the church, there is no room for keeping score unless it is to measure who in this room is the greatest sinner. That's the only score we ought to be keeping. Who in this room is the greatest sinner? You know why? Paul, one of another great leaders in the first church, you know what he said in 1 Timothy 1.15? Jesus came into this world to save sinners from their sin, of whom I am the worst. That's Paul. Paul said, look, you want to get in a competition with me? We'll just compare who is the biggest sinner and in need of God's grace and mercy the most. And Paul said, look, I'm just going to make it very clear. I'm the one who is most in need. He was saying, you want to get in a competition? We'll just do it by sin. I am the worst. You know what? In this church, we have people here who were liars. We have people here who were adulterers. We have people here who have been through abortions. We have people here who have been addicts and been divorced. We have people here who should not have come if it were a do-gooder competition. If you're embarrassed by your past, you are in good company in this room. We're not in a competition with one another. You know why? Because somebody once said, the church is not a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And that's what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to reward those who were well and righteous and self-righteous. He came to heal those who were sick. You're looking for a place for perfect people? This is not your place, because that is not us. Are you looking for a place that is a perfect place? In fact, I always tell people, if you ever come across a perfect church, run away from it as far and as fast and as quick as you can, because the minute you step in, you will ruin it. All right? There is no perfect church. You, you want to find a place of self-righteous, look down on other people, then this is not your place. But if you want to find a place where we admit that we are sick and that we are in need of the physician's perfect touch, this is your place. And when you are ready to let the gospel erode your self-admiring religion, then you will be positioned perfectly for a miracle. And until you can do that, there will be no miracle in your life. You're struggling? Are you sick? You have a past that you're ashamed of? And welcome to the sick ward. You are in the right place. The gospel erodes our self-admiring religion. Now, how does God do that? Well, the gospel tells of our rags to riches story. In fact, truth is, it tells our riches, or a riches to rags story, so that we might know rags to riches. How does it do that? Well, because Jesus left all of the privileges of heaven 
to come and become nothing so that we who are nothing could become everything in him. You know what the amazing thing is about the Bible? Do you realize that as you read through the Bible, it never glosses over the failures, the slip-ups, and the foibles of its main characters, the people who were following God? Do you realize it never glosses over failure? It always just puts it right out there in front of you for everyone to see. In fact, that's exactly what Mark does. If you jump over to Mark 14, verse 66, this is amazing to think that here is Peter, and he crashes big. I just want to walk you through this so you can see and experience the depth of his failure this morning. Listen to this. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls, now to be fair, Peter had pulled out his knife when Jesus was arrested. He swung it, cut off the ear of this guard, and he thought, yeah, yeah, you know, know, I'm doing it. I'm going to die with you, Jesus. But his master is taken away. He's arrested. Jesus says, look, Peter, put your sword away. That's not how we're going to do this. Put it away. It's just, just confused and befuddled, Peter. What, what are you talking about, Jesus? What are we going to do now? Jesus is taken away, and then Peter is led in. And he comes across this little 13, maybe 14, 15-year-old little servant girl, this rugged Galilean fisherman. And she just looks up at him, and he wilts like an Easter lily. Weren't you with him? Weren't you with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, verse 67? But look at verse 68. Peter says, I I, I don't know. I don't even understand what you're saying. What are you talking about? Can't you just know? I mean, you know, if you are a father or a parent of children, you know, right? When you come in and you see your kid with his hands behind his back or her hands behind her back, right? He's got the food all over her face. Did you eat that? Huh? What, no, I, I don't, what, what are you talking about? No, I didn't do it. I mean, you just know instantly. That's Peter right here. W- weren't you with him? I, I don't even know what you're talking about. I, I'm not sure I even understand you. The servant girl later comes across him. And she says, I'm telling you, verse 69, this guy was with them. He's one of them. Verse 70, and again, a second time, Peter just, no, I'm not. I don't know what you're talking about. It goes on. After a little while, those standing near Peter said, Look, Peter, we, we hear how you're talking. We, we see that you're kind of a, we, we, that draw. It, aren't you from up in the hills? You're kind of that hillbilly guy up from Galilee. Aren't you up from the sticks? Aren't, weren't you with Jesus? Aren't you a Galilean? And wasn't he a Galilean? And look at verse 71. It says this. Peter began to swear and curse. You know what he's saying? As he's calling down curses, that word curse means that somebody has to be the recipient of that curse. And many scholars believe, and I think they're right, that he looked over and he kind of got a glimpse of Jesus and said, I don't know that guy, and basically I just assumed that guy would get all of the curses of God. He Let him be damned, go to hell, he can get out of me. I just don't know him. That's the emphasis and the impact of what he's saying about Jesus in this moment. Because hell is a real place. And he's saying, let all of the power of God's curses fall on this man. I do not know him. And Luke says instantly, Jesus' eyes met with Peter's. And the Bible says he remembered what Jesus said, how he would deny him three times before the rooster crowed. Two times. And the Bible says that he literally lost it. You see, for us to experience this rags to riches, if we're going to get rid of this self-admiring religion, we've got to be broken. And what God was doing was literally stripping away any chance that Peter could use to stand before God and say, no, 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 I did it. No, you don't understand, God. I did it. I did it. He was just stripping away the exterior so that Peter could see what he was pretending to be is not who he really was at the core. Because you know what? That's what the gospel does. It, It changes from the inside out. And that's why I tell people all the time, it's not a matter of cleaning up and then getting to know God. It's a matter of getting to know God and then this change from the inside begins to happen as we are broken because of what Christ did for us. You know what 
will keep people away from Christ. One thing that will keep you away from Christ is to think there's something out there that will satisfy the hole in your soul more than Jesus. And God just had to remove all of that. In fact, for some of you, you're trying to fill that hole with your own religion. That's the second thing that will keep people away from Christ. It's the idea that we can earn our acceptance before God by what we do and say and don't do and don't say. God is just trying to break this outward exterior so that he might show Peter with everything else is stripped away and he is bare before Christ, before God. What is missing is Jesus. That's why 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says this about this rags to riches and riches to rags story. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. God is just eroding this self-righteousness. Some of you might be saying, well, you know, that can't happen. I, I know what I've done. God could never overlook my failure. Well, look no further than Peter. Do you realize that this guy who swore down the curses of God onto Christ after the resurrection, after he looked at the face and was accepted and embraced back by Christ, he became one of the most powerful and prominent speakers of the resurrection in the early church. If God can use this spiritual failure to become a spiritual giant, he can use you. John Newton said this, the guy who wrote that song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. He was once counseling a person overwhelmed with guilt, remorse, and just embarrassment over their past. And this is what he said to him. You say it's hard to understand how a holy God can accept such an awful person as you? Well, you express not only a low opinion of yourself, which is right to do, but you also express far too low an opinion of the person, work, and promises of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Redeemer. If God can take a failure like Peter and change him into one of the most prominent leaders, he can take you and meet you at the midst of your past or your present. He can strip away all of the pretenses and build in you from the inside out something that you cannot do on your own. You know how we know that? Because that's the third thing this morning is that the gospel tells us that life is only through, real life is only through a resurrected Jesus. Real life comes only through a resurrected Jesus. Peter knew his new lease on life. It wasn't about adding Jesus as another mix and compartment of his life. It wasn't just putting it all together and saying, oh yeah, I got my Jesus card now and I'm good. He realized that his only hope and his only life was completely, utterly, and completely in Christ. How do I know that? Because not more than about two months or so later, the Spirit began to do something. Jesus went and rose and, and ascended into heaven, and the Spirit came. And I want you to turn with me and kind of see the rest of the story in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 3 and 4 is one of the most incredible stories. There is this crippled beggar lying there, and all of the religious people walk by him every day who are still in this spiritual competition. And one day, two guys come walking by him, Peter and John. And this guy looks up at him and says, Hey! Hey, help me out. Give me some money. And they look and they say, look, we don't have money, but what we do have, we will give it to you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And instantly that man rose up and he started walking and praising and celebrating God. And it started a mob scene, a riot in the city. And in chapter 4 is where we'll pick it up. Look at verses 1 and 2. The priests and the captains of the temple guard, the Sadducees, all of the same guys who had crucified Jesus earlier, the same exact group of people, they came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles, not because they caused this riot and this mob scene, they were disturbed because, not that they made this beggar and, the, and this guy get up and walk, they weren't celebrating that, they were disturbed because, look at what they were doing, they were teaching the people and proclaiming in who? Jesus, the what? The resurrection of the dead. 
They didn't celebrate over this guy getting up and walking for the first time in his life. They were disturbed. Hey, how dare you guys come in here and upset people with that teaching about that guy Jesus? Verse 4. Many who heard the message, however, what? Believed. You know what that word believe means? It means that they came to believe that Jesus, not their own religious attempts, but Jesus was their only hope to be made right before the Father. Many believed, and the number of men grew to 5,000. So they throw these guys in jail. They can't believe they would do this. The next morning, they call them out. Verse 7, Peter and John are brought in before them, and they begin to question them. They say, look, what, what are you doing? All of our lives, we've been walking by. We're religious. We, we've never been able to do anything like this. What kind of power or, or magic or, or medicine? What, what are you doing? What have you done here? What, what kind of charade is this? You're, you're pulling a fast one on these people. And Peter, filled with the Spirit, verse 8, just said this. Rulers, elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this. Here's how we did it. You and all of the people of Israel know this. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He, Jesus, by the way, is the stone that you builders rejected and he has become the capstone. He's become a stumbling block for you. Four, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other, what? Name under heaven given to men by which we must be, what? There is no other name given to men under heaven by which we must be saved. They looked at Peter and John. They, they saw the courage and realized they were unschooled. They're, they're just ordinary men. These guys did this. All of our lives we walked by this crippled man. We could never do anything. They were still in the spiritual comparison. They were still in the I religion phase. But what could they do? Verse 14. They were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they said, what are we going to do? Verse 16. What are we going to do with these men? Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it. There is no way for us to get over this now. What in the world are we going to do? But, verse 17, to stop this thing from spreading, to, to stop this, you know, other people getting healed, and to stop all of these, these bad things from happening, like men who couldn't walk, now walking. We're going to put an end to that, and so what we're going to do is we're going to tell these guys, we're going to warn them, you stop speaking any longer in this, what, religion? No. In this movement? No. In this name. See, that was the message of the first church. It wasn't what Jesus taught. It wasn't what we should do and shouldn't do. The message of hope and change was this. Jesus rose again. Christ is risen. And when that captures your heart, it will erode your self-admiring religion. It will begin to do something in you where you no longer resist God out of fear, but you draw to him in awe. Because the gospel will be bringing real life to you. Look at Peter and John's response, verse 19 and 20. Peter and John replied, Look, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you or rather to obey God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have, what? Seen and, look, we saw Jesus. We saw him. You know what the amazing thing is? This guy, Peter, not more than a few months later, earlier, rather, was cowering in the presence of a mere little servant girl. And now he was standing firm and boldly proclaiming. You know why? Because he saw him, and he heard him, and he touched him, and he saw him. And real life comes because the resurrection tells us everything has changed. Can I ask you this morning, where do you need to meet Jesus? Where is it that you need to collide your life with Jesus? Is it with your own self-attempts at religion? Are you trying to win God's approval through your acts of goodness? 
or not doing bad things or comparing yourself with other people, would you just stop and say, God, I'm sick, I'm hurting, and I need your touch? Is it at your self-attempts at religion? Or maybe this morning it's at your hurt, your failure. Maybe you, you're here this morning you would say, I know what I'm like. I know where I've been. I know what my present is. I know what I'm doing. I know when the lights go down and nobody else is around who I am and what I'm like and the thoughts that go in my mind, and I just don't like it. And I know that I'm just not sure that God could ever even accept or embrace me. Would you today just realize that if he can take Peter, the one who cursed Jesus as he was going to the cross, and then made him a leader of his church. God can embrace you in the midst of your failure. I don't know what that failure is. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's some habit in your life. Maybe it's something that you just can't get past. Today, would you lay down that failure? How do you do that? Two words. Maybe this is where you need to connect with Christ today. Repent and believe. That's our response to the gospel. Repent and and believe. Repent is just basically saying, Jesus, take control. Jesus, I can't do it. I've messed it up. You take over. Repent and then believe. Not in what you do, but in what Christ did for you. You know what happens when you collide with the gospel? Here's what happens. The first thing is you lose your sense of guilt and shame. So many people are moving away from God, but the gospel says, come on. Come to me. I love you. I sent my son to die for you and he rose again so that you could know life. You'll lose guilt and shame when you really embrace the gospel. Not only that, you'll lose your sense of insecurity. This sense of having to be recognized and, and playing off of other people and comparing and, and this sense of if I really let my mask down and I, and I let the shell go and, and they're going to find out who I really am, you'll lose all of that sense of insecurity because you'll realize that God doesn't love you because of who you make yourself to be. He loves you be simply because he loves you. And he sent his son to die for you. You know what else will happen? You'll have an increased sense of humor. You'll be able to laugh about yourself. There's two people who can't laugh about themselves. Those who have superiority complexes and inferiority complexes. Because if I'm superior and I laugh at myself, then that brings me down to your level. And if I'm inferior and I laugh about myself, that just makes the divide even further. But Peter, oh, he could laugh at himself. Could you imagine asking somebody with a superiority complex, hey, are you, a, are you really a Christian? You realize the reaction you get? How dare you? What are you talking about? Isn't it evident by all the things I'm doing? And you know what Peter would say? Yeah, can you believe it? Me? A follower of Jesus? I shouldn't be. And you know what else? He made me the leader of his whole movement. <laughs> I can't believe it. You know why he could laugh at himself? Because he realized that his approval and his acceptance isn't a matter of polls, and public opinion, it's a matter of the opinion that matters the most, God's, which the cross and the resurrection says, I love you, I embrace you, and I have already accepted you. And then you begin to love others. Religious people, they just can't see other people. They're too caught up in competitions and looking at things and outer shells but when we meet Christ and the gospel, we begin to see other people. And we begin to have our hearts broken for who they are and their need and their spiritual poverty and need before Christ. Where do you need to meet Jesus today? Is it your religion? Would you lay that down today? Is it your failure? Would you allow God to say, I've already taken care of that. And would you come this morning and repent and believe and say everything has changed. Father, as we come before you today, Lord, we thank you for the hope that the resurrection brings. Lord, we thank you that your son died in our place. Father, in this room, there are many people who are here out of a religious sense of obligation and duty. Father, help them to see that you don't want a religious connection with them. You want a relationship that is only offered through your Son.
Father, there's others who, who are caught up in their, not their religion, but their failure is right in front of them and they see it so clear. Would you meet them at the point of their need and help them to see that you have already paved a bridged cover that failure in their life? Whatever it is in their past, whatever it is right now in their present, would you help them to see that in Christ there is hope? And Father, for that young man, that young woman, that senior, maybe for the very first time, would you help them to cry out, Lord, I repent and I believe. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand. We want to give you a chance to respond as they did in the early service. Are you caught up with your failure? Are you caught up in religion? Would you just simply come today and repent and believe and say, my hope, my life is not in me, but it's in a resurrected Savior who died for me. And if he can embrace Peter at his failure, he can embrace me as well. Would you come as the choir leads us, as the choir sings about all of the doubts being settled at the cross, would you come as the music begins to play, you come right now. You've just heard a message from God's Word. Right now in our worship time, many are responding to what they have just heard. You can respond too, right where you are. Maybe you've never considered how you can make God the centerpiece of your life, but you can by simply praying a very simple prayer with me right now. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that there is no other way to get to you except through Jesus, God's one and only Son. I believe that He came, that He lived and died and rose again. And now I want to trust Him as my only way to enter into a personal relationship with you, my Heavenly Father. I want to repent of my sins and turn to you and make you my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for accepting me just as I am. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, or even if you've prayed that prayer in the past, your next step is always to grow in your faith. We want to encourage you to find a church that will help you to see how God's Word can make an impact in your daily life. We'd like to have the opportunity to be that church, and you can let us by joining us every Sunday morning at 8.30 and 11 o'clock in one of our weekly worship times. We know that by choosing to watch today, you are seeking to make God a very special part of your life. We hope you'll go even further in this pursuit throughout this next upcoming year. Again, thanks for watching, and we hope that you'll join us again next week at this same exact time.